Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Gamet. Um, I am the Laboratory System Director for the State of Idaho. So those of you who are expecting to see Victor Whedon, um, I am not Victor Whedon, but uh, he sends his apologies this morning. Uh, Victor is uh, a little bit under the weather and he's preparing to go on some, uh, some trips internationally. So he had to uh, send his regrets today and, and that, those were very definitely regrets. He wishes he could be here with you today. He was going to share a message with us about embracing change and the American Academy's role in embracing change. And uh, I've heard his comments before at the American Academy meeting and uh, his, his speech is, is very good and I hope you get the opportunity at some point to hear his speech. Victor is and the American Academy is, uh, let's see if I can figure out the advancement of the slides here, a member of the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations and that's who I'm with as well. I'm the chair of the, the Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations. You can see our members listed there on the left hand side of the slide. Uh, we do have a membership of over 15,000 forensic practitioners that we represent uh, from forensic nurses to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, lab directors with ASCLAD, uh, the International Association of Identification. So we have a diverse group <clears throat> of, uh, of laboratory scientists and laboratory leaders. You can see our mission there uh, to influence public policy at the national level and to make a compelling case for greater federal funding for, for public crime laboratories and medical examiner offices. We also do represent through name the National Medical Association or the National Association of Medical Examiners. Uh, so, again, we uh, we represent a lot of different interests. But the message that I want to bring is is a message like uh, the one in our introduction, which is uh, please join us. Uh, we would love to join with you, and I think we're a force uh, for good as we join together. The Consortium of Forensic Science Organizations in 2014, uh, we joined with many in getting Coverdell funding for the laboratories at a figure of $12 million last year. We also provided new working drafts on criminal justice and forensic science reform. Um, I call it advancement. I, I don't necessarily call it reform. Uh, that's what we're going forward with is uh, forensic science advancement. Also, we were very successful in uh, putting practitioners on not only the National Commission, which you'll hear about in a minute from Jerry Laporte, but also on the OSAC structure. We're grateful to NIST in, in allowing many practitioners uh, to be represented on that structure. We've also responded to many of the documents coming out of the National Commission. We've been very involved in that process. And then one other success that CFSO had last year was the sudden death in the Young Bill. That was a six-year effort, both bipartisan by Cameral, um, endorsed by mostly by name, one of the members of CFSO, and it was signed into law in December of this year. You can see here the, the actual signing event, which we're very proud of that legislation going through. It's a very important piece of legislation. So you can see that we're involved um, not only on legislation for funding, but we're also involved in other types of legislation that help uh, the practice of forensic science. One of the big things that we do every year is Coverdale. We advocate for Coverdale. We generally start out by writing a letter to the Attorney General asking for Coverdale funding for laboratories. Then we follow up with letters uh, to the federal agencies and, and then generally go to both bodies of Congress asking for this funding. We go to all the appropriators and visit them personally, write letters, encourage our labs and our, our staff to write letters. Uh, the International Association for Identification and ASCLAD and, and others last year were very active in a letter writing campaign. So where are we at? Well, last year in 2015, uh, we got 12 million. Uh, this is an appropriation of, uh, you know, it, it's significant for laboratories, I believe, but not as significant as it needs to be because the number is really after we get all of the administrative expenses out of the way and things really laboratories are seeing about 10 million dollars of funding so what does coverdale go for in your laboratories well this is the the money that's mostly spent on the non-dna disciplines and in my opinion and as a lab system director that's where the really important things are happening that aren't the, uh, the, the sexual assault nature and things uh, like that. There are some things like toxicology that we do uh, have a, a, a sexual assault um, nexus to, but most of these things, you're talking your latent prints is where I spend a lot of money with, with Coverdell funding. Uh, toxicology, chemistry, these are some other disciplines that are important. We call them the forgotten disciplines because often they're not funded. 
So in 2016, the budget that you're hearing about right now, the markups that you're hearing about coming out of DC right now, uh, that number right now is zero. Uh, this, this funding is critical to your laboratory. So again, with the message of join with us, uh, we need your support. Uh, there are many organizations that are writing letters and making phone calls right now. Uh, this number needs to be closer to the $35 million that it's authorized to be. And so we fight for that every year. But it's the same game every year. It's a fight, and it shouldn't be a fight. This should be money that's just automatic to laboratories because your laboratories need it. I was talking to several in the, in the lobby this morning that, that mentioned budget cuts coming to laboratories and prosecutors' offices and, and public defenders' offices. Uh, this, this funding is critical to labs. This talks about medical examiners. This is the only funding available for medical examiners' offices. So we obviously have name in our group. <clears throat> they can use this for facilities, personnel, computerization, all these things that you see up here. Probably most important for Coverdale is education and training. This is where my laboratory uses this money. So when we're able to use this money uh, to send analysts to training, to the American Academy meeting, to other meetings, regional and, and national meetings, this is where they're going and learning how to stay current in their disciplines. This is where we're eliminating some of those problems that you're seeing on a national level right now in the newspapers where they're talking about that the analysts aren't properly trained. This is how we can eliminate some of that problem. I just throw this slide up there for fun, just so you can see how active CFSO is. Uh, this is a report that I give to our membership uh, on a monthly basis. These are the activities that I reported to them in March. So we're very, very active on the Hill and otherwise in getting our information out there. One of the, the tools that we use to make that happen is our newsletter. You can see it on our website and I've listed that for you there. Uh, I do anticipate putting out a new newsletter probably tomorrow. So the information is current. Um, hopefully there's some budget information there for you. There's also a lot of information on what we're involved with, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. These are our legislative priorities, our published legislative priorities for the next year, and what we're working on currently. And you'll notice that number one in bold there is the Forensic Science Reform or Advancement Bill. You'll hear about that in a few minutes um, when Mr. Stephen Towson comes. Uh, from Senator Cornyn's office. Hopefully his, his train is arriving at the station as we speak and he'll be able to, to talk to you more about it and I will talk about that in just a minute. But you'll see some of the other things that are coming up in the National Commission meetings right now are priorities to us as well. Um, accreditation funding for laboratories and medical examiner's office, cert certification funding for forensic practitioners. These are the things that we're keying in on as well as you are keying in on. So again, let's partner and let's be better for our partnership. We also talked, and I talked to Jerry this morning, and he'll, you'll hear from him maybe a little this afternoon about grant reform and some of the things that we're doing with grants to make them a little bit more available or a little bit uh, better, better used by laboratories. And, and his group at NIJ, they're doing fantastic work and they're partnering with us uh, to make some changes to those programs to be more helpful to laboratories. But you'll see those other things there. We represent a, a a broad variety of, of practitioners, so our interests are many. So let's talk about the Forensic Science Reform Act, the history, and I hope to set a little bit of the stage when you hear from, from Steve in the South, well, in a few minutes, hopefully. So Senate Bill uh, 132, this is the 112th Congress, so we're going back to 2011. Now this, is, this has been worked on now for what, six years, five years? Um, so. We're a long ways into this process. In the beginning, you'll notice there, there was no co-sponsor. He was going it on his own. Um, 113th Congress, last year, March. Now we have one Republican and one Democrat. We bring on Senator Cornyn and um, Senator, Blu or, yeah, Richard Blumenthal from, from Connecticut. So now we have two sponsors two co-sponsors, and we're also working on making this bicameral. This did get referred to committee, and this is what it says. And the reason I'm, I'm going to go through this a little bit is because when I brought this up with our, our board, the ASCLAD board, I'm on the ASCLAD board, and uh, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of, well, I don't support this or I don't support that. And when we came down to it and, and had everybody read the bill and go through and tell us what they would change, 
there was very little dissent from how it was written. So what I hope to do this morning for a minute is, number one, encourage you to go and read it. And number two, to just kind of tell you briefly about what's in it. So what this does, or at least according to the version from last year, sets up a forensic science board appointed by the president. And it's also composed of scientists, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and other key stakeholders. Sounds like a familiar concept. Office of Forensic Science set up at uh, Justice, led by a director appointed by the Attorney General. Committees, this might sound familiar too, comprised of practitioners. Might sound very similar to something called OSAC. A director of OFS and the director of NIST established a memorandum of understanding. Again, this is sounding very familiar. Requires forensic scientist laboratory or forensic science laboratories to be accredited. Sounds like a very familiar paper, uh, probably soon coming out of the National Commission, um, already with medical examiners. Also requires personnel to be certified. Now, I can speak from a position of authority on this one. Idaho, I believe at this point, I could be corrected, but I believe Idaho is the only state uh, laboratory or laboratory system in the country to require scientists to be certified. All of my scientists are required to be certified. So they either go through IAI, they go through uh, ABC or some other mechanism to, to get that certification, but that's a requirement for employment at our laboratory. This is important. Um, it's, but it's very hard to do. It's very hard to, to ensure that this is, is something that happens in a laboratory. So um, we're also looking at, uh, at funding for some of those kind of things. And that'll be addressed in the, the legislation as well. So when we're looking at uh, bullet point two, accreditation and certification standards and support for helping laboratories meet those standards. And we also need to establish priorities, and that's in this bill as well. Priorities for the research funding and the serious uh, scientific research needs related to forensic science. It also looks at new technologies that are coming out. I was talking to Jerry this morning about uh, some DNA technologies that are coming out and how we're going to implement those in the laboratory because we want to, in Idaho at least, we want to be an early adopter lab of some of these new technologies and how I will be able to fund some of those new technologies coming into the laboratory. So we're looking for more mechanisms to do that through the legislation. And, and maybe most importantly for this group, it includes a provision for the training of judges, attorneys, and also law enforcement. So that's what's in that Senate 2177. Again, I encourage you to go and read it and find out what's there and engage with it. We have. CFSO provided a, a new draft based on comments from our, our membership, and we've provided that to the Hill. I will provide that to you if you'd like to see it. Um, we're pretty proud of it. So again, we encourage you to dialogue with us and tell us what, what isn't going to work or what, uh, what you see as problematic. This is what we've asked for. We believe that in the next Congress, in the current Congress, the executive branch has implemented many efforts uh, already to improve forensic science, and I would uh, mention the OSAC specifically. The forensic community is, is more and more embracing this, this, uh, this OSAC structure. We're on it. We have many members on it. I believe, and Mark can tell me, probably in his presentation he'll have the figures, but I believe it's upwards of 70% um, active practitioners. That's huge. When you bring in scientists to discussion and, and encourage them to engage in the dialogue, you're going to get what's really going on in the laboratories, where the problems are, and what they need to, what they need to address in the laboratories. And, and I'm convinced I'm a part of it. I'm on the uh, Quality Infrastructure Committee. And while you may not see what's happening, I guarantee you that there are things happening. Um, the QIC is very, very active. And we hope to be more public in what's coming out. Maybe this summer, you'll start to see some of the process documents and some of the flow documents that are coming out of OSAC. So what have we asked Congress? Well, these are the, the bullet points of what we've asked them for. Um, again, we're looking for a long-term and sustainable infrastructure and spending or funding for, from the federal government. If we're going to run OSAC long term, it's not going to run at $3 million. It's not going to happen if we want to be impactful. Um, also, right now, that funding is not codified. 
So we need to, to make sure that that happens, and that's what we're looking to do. We still want to see an Office of Forensic Science at the Department of Justice. We feel like that's important, and I'll talk about more about that in just a second. But we want to see a forensic science board that, that is mostly made up of practitioners to oversee that OSAC structure, again, codifying OSAC, um, making mandatory accreditation and certification. For those of you in the room who don't understand that process, I want to go into that for just a second. So accreditation is a process used by the laboratory. So my laboratory is accredited to a 17025, to an international standard, which is important to me because there's a whole bunch of things that I have to conform with uh, basically on a yearly basis as we go in and audit ourselves and we have external auditors come in. Um, those mainly are management processes. So what we're looking at is how my system deals with documents, um, how we approve things, how we deal with problems. You'll hear some more about that this afternoon. But accreditation is a huge process to a laboratory. There are many accrediting bodies in this country now. Um, all of them, hopefully, and Kermit will talk about this this afternoon, uh, hopefully to an ILAC um, type organization, to an international organization. And there are at least three accrediting bodies in our country now. Certification is different. Certification is the scientist level. So that's them going in and taking a test or uh, taking some kind of competency to show that uh, an outside organization looks at them and, and deems them competent um, in their discipline. So those two things are, are very important. It's important to us at CFSO and, and to our members that there's comprehensive, basic, and applied forensic uh, research. And also that it's a coordinated strategy. Uh, Victor would tell you this morning, I think, I've, I've talked to him a lot about this, it's important to sometimes have duplicitous research in different areas, but it's also important that those efforts are coordinated. Some of our other asks uh, clearly define jurisdictions for things. Um, right now, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of people kind of run into each other area and uh, we're duplicating efforts quite a bit. Um, I think that some of those efforts are being resolved with the National Commission and the OSAC structure, which is good, and I think we need to clearly, more clearly define that. Also, uh, we, we need the science and the Judiciary Committees to support this. That's where you can be helpful as well. Uh, the ABA and I think other organizations that, that you represent can tell Congress, this is what we're looking for. We want to go forward united. This is why we feel that NIST and DOJ are good venues and, and good avenues for these things to happen. You'll notice that NIST, advancing measurement science standards and technology. Well, that's important. That's what we're looking for in forensic science. That's what the OSAC is all about. That's why we support the OSAC. DOJ's mission, and I highlighted the last part, to ensure fair and impartial administration of justice for all Americans. That's why we're supportive of that board being at justice, because that's their mission. Fair and impartial administration of justice. And that's what forensic science is. We, we are an addendum to the criminal justice system. So here's some interesting things that you're seeing right now in the news. Um, there's some bad news out there. You're seeing some, uh, some stuff on unsubmitted sexual assault kits. You saw, you're seeing a lot of stuff in the news about rapid DNA and how these new rapid DNA instruments will solve this unsubmitted sexual assault backlog, or I call it uh, the unsubmitted, and thanks Jerry for that word because I think it's appropriate. These kits aren't sitting in my laboratory. These kits are sitting mostly on law enforcement shelves, and they need to be submitted into the laboratory and they need to be worked. Uh, we, we had a Senate hearing on that a couple weeks ago that many of you may have heard. Well, we also heard about the FBI hair review issue that's going on that's hitting the news right now and some issues with the Washington, D.C. lab. Well, I think legislation will go far to help some of these things and requiring some of the things that we just talked about. But I also think it's important that the forensic community and CFSO specifically has strong leadership in the forensic community. I want to talk about two things that we've done recently that you might be interested in. So on the unsubmitted sexual assault kit issue, we've been very actively engaging uh, with NIJ and other entities, and again, I'm going to thank Jerry and hopefully talk some about this in his presentation. 
We've been very active at getting these kits worked. And I want to mention these states specifically that have been very engaged in this process. Many of these states have solved it or eliminated completely their unsubmitted kit problem. Um, in my state, we're getting very, very close. We have only a few kits left, uh, but many of these states have completely eliminated their unsubmitted kits. So kudos to them for stepping out and being strong leaders in the forensic community. The FBI allele table issue that you're seeing right now, it's a, it's a big problem. Well, once we became aware of it as lab directors and other scientists in the community, there was a meeting. And we called the meeting, uh, CFSO and ASCLAD called the meeting. We brought in all the accrediting bodies. We brought in the FBI lab, brought in even Wiley as the publisher of the Journal of Forensic Science. Um, all these people we brought to the table and we said, what do we need to do? How do we dialogue this issue? How do we get the information out? So within a few days, and almost within a few hours, we had publications and, and papers out to our membership telling them, alerting them to the problem, what the problem was, and also getting them information on how they could address the problem in their states and in their laboratories. Uh, we had a dialogue with prosecutors and, and defense attorneys uh, to get the information out. In my state, the notification went out uh, to both the, the prosecutor's offices and also to the criminal defense lawyers in my state. It went out to every single one of them within a matter of days of us finding out of, about this issue. Again, I think this is a good example of the forensic community being strong leaders within their community. Uh, Mark, I appreciate, has, has given me several times it's important that we give the, the carrot approach. Maybe there's a little bit of the stick in there with the legislation, but the carrot approach is we need to have people conform because they want to conform, because it's the right thing to do. And that's what the OSAC is all about. We set up all of these, these structures, but we want the laboratories to engage um, on their own because it's the right thing to do. What can our community do? Well, what I would propose is that we get together, that we get our message together, that we bring law enforcement, laboratories, and all of us in the, the legal arena, we bring us all together, and that we provide some concerted or, or common direction to Congress. We also continue to find the areas of mutual interest. I think that those, these things that I've spoken about today probably are things that you're interested in. Uh, they're probably things that we could all agree upon. So I hope that you'll engage with us. I hope that uh, you'll come with us, that if there are areas of differences, that we talk them out and that we figure out where those can be resolved and how those can be resolved. So we, we stand ready to come to the table with you and, and hopefully you'll engage with us.